good to be with you. Pastor and Lisa, thank you so much for the opportunity. I bring y'all greetings from my pretty fabulous family. My amazing husband, Barry, and I just celebrated an anniversary. It was number 316. We celebrate by the month, and you can do the math if you'd like. (laughs) And God has blessed our love through the miracle of adoption with three incredible children. And right now, they are all praying for us. When I was an atheist, Christian friends used to always give me Bibles, little Bibles, big Bibles. I had stacks of Bibles on my shelf from well-meaning Christians. And every once in a while, when I was bored to tears with everything else I had to read, I would reach for one of the Bibles and I'd open it up. And it seemed to me that the words were even thinner than the paper it was written on. It was like a ball bouncing off of a wall. But when Jesus interrupted my atheistic existence, the first thing I wanted was a Bible. And when I opened it up, it was no longer a book. It was suddenly a voice. And I wanted to hear it. And I wanted to study it. It was like life itself. And so I've been studying since then. And one of the studies that I've returned to several times since is a study on the theme of worship. And during one of those studies, a passage in particular stood out to me because it described a challenge that has been faced by the people of God in every century, a challenge that can cause our worship or our attempts at worship to really be nothing but vanity. And so this morning, I'm gonna invite you to study that passage with me. Now, when we begin to study a passage in the scripture, we ask some general questions of context. Who said what to whom? When, where, how? And if possible, to discern why. Then we identify a timeless principle And we expend the energy to apply it to our 21st century lives. And so this morning, I'm going to rearrange that just slightly. And we're going to answer most but not all of the context questions. We are going to identify the timeless principle. We're going to expend a good amount of energy applying that principle to our lives. And then at the very end, we're going to loop back around and place that principle back in its original context and ask the final question of why. So I invite you to look with me at some of the less than heartwarming words of Jesus that perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that Hallmark has not made a card out of. (laughs) Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 7. Jesus says... You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Again, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. The questions of context. First, who said what to whom? Well, we have Jesus, and he's speaking to two groups of leaders. He's speaking to the Pharisees and the teacher of the law, teachers of the law. And what he says to them is actually words from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 3, says, These people come near me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. The when of this passage is really interesting. I want you to think of it as the center of a miracle and a faith Um, sandwich. And so right before this, Jesus feeds the 5,000 and he talks to Peter about having little faith. Then we have our passage. Right after this, he speaks to a Canaanite woman about having great faith and then he feeds the 4,000. 
Where? We're at Gennesaret on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. How? I think we can safely say the tone is confrontational. And we're going to save the why for later. Jesus says, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. So evidently, the people in the Old Testament faced a challenge that the people in the New Testament also faced, that we face today. And it is a challenge of being able to distinguish being able to discern, being able to tell the difference between forms and substance. Jesus said that the people honored God with their forms. He said, they honor me with their lips. They said the right things at the right times. They did the right things in front of the right people, but their hearts what God looks for, what he longs for, hearts that worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus said that their hearts were far, far away from him. And so Jesus passes his hands over forms that lack substance. He passes his hands over forms that lack substance, and he says, vanity. Form without substance is vain. It is fruitless. It is to no end. It is worthless. The challenge before us is distinguishing between forms and substance. Now, let me layer some illustrations over this. Let's say that my new friend Lisa and I are talking. And Lisa says, Alicia, I'm thirsty. And I say, Lisa, I can take care of that. And so I go back into the kitchen and I get this form. It has no substance within. It's just a form. And I hand it to her and she says, well, thanks, Alicia, but the form without any substance is useless to meet her real need. True? And so I think, oh, I'm so sorry, Lisa. I don't know what what on earth was in my mind. I'll be right back. And so I put down the form. I go back to the kitchen. I turn on the faucet. I cut my hands under some pure substance, no real transferable form to carry it in. And I say, here you are, my friend. (laughs) So the form without any substance was useless to meet her need. But the substance without any form was unusable. You need both. They're dependent and yet they're distinct. Let me layer another illustration. Consider your modern orange. Now, to my rather unagricultural eyes, this orange only has two parts. It's got the form, it's got the peel, and then it has the substance. It has the stuff inside, the stuff I want to get to, that tastes good, that's going to give me my daily dose of vitamin C. So let me ask you a question. Is the form necessary? Yes, absolutely. The form protects the substance. The form preserves the substance. The form prolongs the substance's life. But is the form the substance itself? Mm -mm. No, they're dependent and yet distinct. Now, what if I were to become confused and I were to start thinking, no, 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 the form is the most important part. The form is what will nourish me. The form is what will strengthen me. I'm so convinced that the form is the substance that I'm going to eat it. I'm going to take a bite. Mm. What did I just taste? This is a time for group interaction. (laughs) What did I just taste? Sour. Yes. Sour. Bitter. Because form without substance is all that. Form without substance is bitterness. Form without substance is vanity. Thank you. (laughs) I've never had it explode like that before. (laughs) It's the exploding orange. (laughs) Uh, But how easy it is to confuse the two, isn't it? How easy it is to confuse singing for worship How easy it is to confuse reading the Bible for obeying God's word. How easy it is to confuse coming to church with being the church. 
how easy it is to confuse experiencing God's presence with with actually walking intimately with God as a person. How easy it is to see form and substance confusion in other cultures and in other generations. And yet to miss form and substance confusion in our own culture, in our own generation. To miss seeing how we're passing on hand-me-down form to the next generation and wondering why they're just not as excited about it as they should be. Now, this challenge of distinguishing between forms and substance saturates the teachings of Jesus. But this morning, we are going to look at three ways in which form and substance confusion creates absolute chaos. Form and substance confusion creates absolute chaos in our pursuit of unity, our pursuit of ministry, and by that I mean the service that overflows from your life and your faith, and our pursuit of integrity. So first consider with me the chaos that form and substance confusion causes in our pursuit of unity. Now, a long, long time ago, I was preparing to go serve as a missionary in Asia. And I wanted to make sure that I presented myself as a modest woman of God. So back in the day, modesty in South Texas, which is where I lived, meant, thank you, (laughs) meant really, really long dresses. Now they've come back recently, but back then they weren't near as cute. So we used to call them granny dresses. They went all the way down to the ground, but it was South Texas. And so everything we had was sleeveless and we gave ourselves a bit of breathing room. I sewed myself to go on my missions trip, my own wardrobe of granny dresses. And I put on my favorite navy blue one on the plane. I hopped off the plane in Hong Kong and I was greeted by these beautiful Chinese female ministers whose skirt lines were above their knees, but who in that culture at that time would have never bared their arms. And they would have never had a neckline below their collarbone. So we're in the airport and we're staring at each other. And we had a couple of choices, didn't we? We could have looked at each other and dismissed one another as a modest woman of God. Or we could have looked at one another and said, you know, perhaps modesty in South Texas takes on a different form than it does in Hong Kong. Which is what we did. We looked at one another and we laughed and then we did the only reasonable thing you can do in such a situation. We went shopping. (laughs) You know, so much of what divides us has nothing to do with anything Jesus died for. Another illustration, there are these women in my life whom are mentors, and they are from a completely different culture and a completely different generation. And every year I have the privilege of spending a couple of days with them on a prayer retreat. Well, one time in particular, we were all around the dinner table and they were sharing the agony they felt in their hearts how grieved they were about the kind of music that had entered the church they were attending. And I listened with interest. And they talked about how studies had actually been done. And when this type of music played in the presence of farm animals, (laughs) that cows stopped giving milk because the rhythm of the music was so contrary to the rhythm of life. And when this music was played in the presence of chickens, the chickens would just up and die. because it was so contrary to the rhythm of life. So I'm eating thinking, what kind of way far industrial sound? What are they listening to? And then they started mentioning specific titles of specific songs. And I thought, oh, they're talking about my music. This is my worship. And so as I sat there in silence, which was definitely the wisest posture at that particular moment, I realized, you know, this is an issue of generational and probably cultural form and substance. Because the forms that carried true worship for my sisters from a different culture and a different generation did not carry true worship for me and vice versa. There are many in the church today, capital C Church, that love the hymnal. And then there are others of us who prefer to sing off the wall. But really, what's the hymnal? It's a book. It's a form. What's the projector? It's a machine. It's a form. 
And unless those forms are filled with the substance Jesus is looking for, hearts that worship him in spirit and in truth, Jesus is going to pass his hands over the hymnal and the projector equally, and he's going to say, vanity. When it comes to our pursuit of unity, form and substance confusion creates short-sighted judgments and long-lasting divisions. I want you to consider the chaos that can also result when we experience form and substance confusion in the area of ministry, in our pursuit of serving, wherever that happens to be, in the home, in the business, in the marketplace, wherever it is that God has planted you. I think that all of us remember forms that used to work, don't we? Whether it was a flowchart at work, it was a certain system that you had set up in the home, whether it was timeouts if you're a parent, there used to be some kind of system, some kind of form that used to be fruitful and now not so much. But our natural tendency as humans is to keep dragging that old form with us and putting it back in place and stepping back, waiting for it to suddenly give birth to the substance we remember and the substance that was so meaningful. But form is not the source of servant, of substance. Form is the servant of substance. Form isn't the creator of substance. Form is the caregiver of substance. And regard, if you don't have substance, it doesn't matter how fancy your form is, it's going to dry up really, really quickly. And so the religious leaders of Jesus' day that he was speaking to in that context, the ones that had come to evaluate him, oh, they loved forms. They loved counting forms. They loved measuring forms. They loved measuring other people by forms. And so I want you with this principle in the forefront of your mind now to consider a passage in Luke chapter 5, verse 36 through 39. Jesus says, no one tears a patch in a new garment and sews it onto an old one. If he does, he'll have torn the new garment. The patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins. And the wine will run out. And the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one drinking the old wine wants the new. Because he says... The old wine is better. I think that the people in Jesus' day prayed the same kind of prayers that we do. Oh God, would you do something new? And I think they also had this unspoken addendum. While you're doing something new, would you mind using our old systems? And God says, I am doing something new. Even now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? But this something new may not be carried well by your something old. The religious leaders of Jesus' day weren't willing to release what they could count in order to accept what would set them free. Really, what a pity, isn't it? To treasure the cup more than the life-giving water that it can hold. When it comes to our pursuit of service, our pursuit of ministry... Form and substance confusion causes tired practices that are fought for, but perhaps they become lifeless. And I'd also like you to consider with me the absolute chaos that can ensue when we experience form and substance confusion in our pursuit of personal integrity. The harshest words of Jesus, the harshest words, words of Jesus were not reserved for those who did not know him. The harshest words of Jesus were reserved for hypocrites, reserved for those who hoped that their visibly seen form would somehow be a substitute for interior integrity. Consider with me Matthew chapter 23. We're going to start in verse 23. Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! 
You give a tenth of your spices. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Woe to them. Woe to me. Woe to us. We tithe, we give, and we should continue. But have we neglected other important matters of God's law? Are we fighting for justice for the helpless? Are we showing mercy to the broken in mind? Are we being faithful to our covenants and to others' covenants? Jesus continues in verse 25. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to them. Woe to me. Woe to us. On the outside family, we may represent well. We may invest a whole lot of time and money making sure that what people see shines. But there is no substitute for substance. What is within? Is there greed? Is there self-indulgence? Is there pride? Jesus continues, verse 27, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. Woe to them and woe to me and woe to us. We may be the hope of our family. We may be the darling of the office. We may be the one everybody depends upon, but God searches the interior spaces of us and his eyes rest upon who we are when no one else is looking. So on the inside, are we caressing things that Jesus was crucified for? Are we nurturing things that he saw from the cross? and experienced unbelievable pain to pay for? Is there anything dead or unclean within? Integrity has no doubles. Integrity has no stand-ins. When it comes to our pursuit of integrity, form and substance confusion creates an arrogant religion. It breeds a polished hypocrisy, a challenge in the Old Testament, a challenge in the New Testament, a challenge we have today, a challenge of distinguishing between the forms and the substance. So now let's take that timeless challenge and reinsert it back in its original context. What prompted this kind of rebuke from Jesus? What prompted him to call down Isaiah 29 on his listeners? We see that context described in Matthew 15, earlier in the chapter. We'll start with verse 1. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Here it is. This is what was bugging them. Jesus' disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate. This is what preceded Jesus calling down Isaiah 29 on them. And initially, when we first glance at that, we think, oh, come on, guys, really? Washing your hands? Form? Form, how clearly is that form? You know, it wasn't clear to them at all. This ancient tradition the ceremonial washing of hands was a sacred tradition. It had been passed on generation to generation. It was eventually recorded in the Mishnah. It had become a matter of conscience and it was enforced with fervor. To break this tradition was seen as a transgression against God himself. One of the rabbis, Rabbi Joseph, was quoted as saying that to eat with unwashed hands was as great a sin as adultery. 
There was another rabbi, Rabbi Akiba, and he was imprisoned for some reason. And each day he was given two glasses of water, one to drink because we need water to live, and another glass with which to wash his hands. There was an accident. One of them tipped over. All of its contents spilled on the ground. He had one glass left. What do you think he did with it? Did he drink it or wash his hands? He washed his hands. And this is what he's quoted as saying, I would rather die than transgress the tradition of the elders. For them, that form had become substance. The form had become substance. And I am certain that that form and substance confusion caused incredible problems in their pursuit of unity, that it made ineffective some of their pursuits of ministry, that it perhaps created great chasms on the inside in their pursuits of integrity. But you know what grieves me the most? Their form and substance confusion caused them to miss the manifest presence of God in their midst. They couldn't see Jesus. They couldn't see Jesus. May God help us. May God help us be flexible with forms. May he help us honor the forms that have served other generations well. May he help us hold our own forms rather lightly. May he help us free the next generation to wrap new forms around substance Flexible with form, but may he strengthen us to be stubborn regarding substance. May we be stubbornly committed to being individuals, to being a community that worships God in spirit and in truth. May our forms never be an attempt to distract other people, let alone God, from our hearts. And may God help us to stop spending our daily limited amount of emotional energy being offended by things that do not offend God. So this morning, I am going to read a few prayers. I'm going to read them in silence. And then I'm going to ask one question. So while I read these prayers, I encourage you to just rest, but listen. Listen to see if God is bringing anything to your attention. And write that down or nudge a friend. Say there's something I need to talk about. And then as I said, one final question. Here are the prayers. God, in your mercy, please reveal to us any way in which we devalue others' sincere souls simply because of their form. Father, we ask that you will also reveal to us any circumstances where our hope and service and ministry is in forms instead of substance. We wait upon you. Father, reveal to us any hypocrisy that we have justified and rationalized in our lives. And Father, reveal to us any way that our focus on form is blinding us to the manifestation of your presence. We just want to see Jesus. Jesus.